are the resistors? This is a difficult question to answer because the resistors refuse to make any formal attempt at self-definition. They've been called a pocket of imagination in the wake of a hypermedicated society saturated by fact and information. They were activists and feminists who sought to reconnect with nature from which they felt estranged, both in the way that society was subsumed in a digital cloud of information and through the enforced pharmaceutical tyranny over their bodies. They sought a way out, a way for women specifically to regroup on their own terms. We could also look to an electrical grid for the answer. The resistors took their name from the device that poses resistance to an electrical current. At any instant of time, the power P consumed by a resistor of resistance R is calculated as, where V is the voltage across the resistor and I is the current flowing through it. The power is converted into heat, which must be dissipated by the resistor's package before its temperature rises excessively. Resistors operate very simply. They are ubiquitous. The resistors formed with this resonance in mind. They formed in opposition to the excessive greed of large corporate conglomerates who sought to impose their visions and systems, not only socially but also physically, in, ways that, in the ways that human bodies perceive and think and participate in society. The resistors formed to dissipate the dominant forms of power. The resistors took issue with pharmaceutical companies and their role in the growing dependence on what were called enhancements, the ways they were used to supersede natural rhythms and processes, and especially the advanced cognitive agents, and especially V. The or valedictorian's chemical structure is quite simple. It's two rings and dioxygenation allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier with ease and function specifically to accelerate memory and related processes. The rate of memory acquisition and recall in humans on valedictorian is quadruple the natural rate. This is what a brain on V looks like. All the parts lit up with the frontal cortex on fire. <coughs> Some of the biggest problems with V were the ways that it altered the processing and storage of memory. At a cellular level, memory is fruit-shaped. The pineapple is the most integrated and evolved type of storage. It gathers information, but also has strong support so that it can both accommodate new information and promote integration. The pomegranate. This is what V encourages over time. Clusters of memory form like beads, placed together at incredible speed. But they're often disorganized, and they're also discrete, which makes them difficult to integrate. The hive is a stable structure which hardens when the pomegranate memory ages. Pomegranate brains without a, a husk are likely to suffer the consequences of not having a support system in place. They may have breakdowns, are likely to be scattered, and often develop mental fissures. The resistors were formed by a group of friends headed by Jack Leon and Shanna Stone as a refuge, as an alternate mode of life. And after a series of pharmaceutical factory fires and chemical adulterations, there were great shortages of valedictorian, and many suffered its consequences. Unsupervised and immediate withdrawal of V can lead to seizures, brownouts, and breakdowns. And as a result, more and more women started defecting from their previous way of life and seeking out the resistors. Resistors have been implicated in starting these factory fires, but no definite link has ever been found. In general, resistors were nonviolent and intended to dissipate rather than ignite violence. However, supporters of more radical measures were also drawn to their camps. One police raid not long after the fires found texts from Solanus and also texts from Holzer in the communal notebook. Make of this what you will. We'll now listen to the stories of four resistors, of Jack and Shauna, the founders of the resistors, who will talk about how and why they started the movement. We'll also hear from Sela and Hannah, who described what led them to join the resistors, as well as their journey to the camps and their first encounter with the resistors. These women agree to speak under the condition that I am unable to record or share their physical images. The following are recordings of stories from these four women's lives in their own words. We were a refuge for women on the outskirts, misfits, loners, sirens. Girls who'd collapsed under chemical floods, women who wanted to feel less alienated. 
Word traveled by mouth. We weren't on social networks. We shunned devices. Anything that enforced a distance between us and living in the world. As in the natural world, not the anthropocentric, not the castles and the webs of digital information we'd spun around ourselves like we were living in a dream and never stepped out from. The information cloud surrounding New York City at that time was traveling at such a speed that it collapsed the neural circuits of the unequipped mind, and no one was speaking out against it. Those who'd gone off the grid wanted nothing to do with it. The rest were connected, plugged in, and that left very little space for a reflective thought or the solitude it required. We were all accompanied by devices and always reachable. There was little time for thinking in any focused, connected way. Where did I first hear of the resistors? In the hospital, undergoing the scrupulous process of neural reconfiguration. There were other girls on the floor, ten of us at one time, many in the same predicament. They isolated us from the others. We, with unstable mind, had acquired memory too quickly for our young neural networks to support. The result? Cracks and collapses. They wipe us out like hard drives, then try to reset us again with storytelling and backup memory configurations. I wasn't there for a full course of treatment. I escaped and I left, joined the resistance. There wasn't anywhere else to go, not at that age, not with unsound mind, not without enhancements. I would have been sent back. I wouldn't have made it to the camp without the help of my friends. And I wouldn't have known about the resistance, except that I met Tara on the floor, and she'd spent time there. I was older, and because of this, I had more insight, and earlier. I'd been born on the cusp. From a young age, I swallowed all modes of pills and tablets multiple times a day, down cupfuls of elixir and sprinkled powders over each meal. We were early adapters. My father was on the board of the Lumen Corporation, the company that had first isolated the compounds known as memory accelerators, and he was part of the team responsible for valedictorian success, purported to be safe enough for children over 12, and which accelerated retention of fact and image more than four times the natural rate. Of course, because of this, I excelled in school, light years ahead of my classmates, this was the beginning of the race to keep up. If these chemicals turn children into precocious geniuses, then why would parents not give them an early advantage? Early advantages, as shown, have the longest lasting influence, paramount for success. But then as the numbers of children kept taking V grew larger, the ones who weren't on the regimen were left behind, labeled slow. There was little hope for their making any contribution to society. Kids began needing to take V to keep up. That's just what my father and his colleagues wanted. It was a brilliant business plan, and they reaped great rewards, both financially and personally. They were revered for their discovery, widely recognized as advancing human life. So this is Jack, who is founder of the Resistors. Science said, we are living in a new age, and yet to embrace it, you gave up everything inherently unique about yourself. A connection to nature, the cycles of regeneration. As I said, we were early adapters. My mother had been receiving supplies of cognitive enhancements from my father for years, and she was smart and so sharp, but she couldn't handle V. She'd taken it too early, before they knew of its detrimental effects. Too much clutter, and not enough plasticity to handle the new onslaught of information. Her neural networks collapsed. Usually, the collapse happened a little at a time, like first cracks in the wall and wallpaper peeling. One day, she was fine. The next, I found her catatonic. I came home from school and she'd never gotten up. She was breathing and slightly responsive, but not speaking words I understood. Her language center had taken a hit. She never recovered from it. Not fully. I didn't either. 
she never came home again. She had a catheter and lines in her arm and at the base of her neck and a tube placed into her stomach. She was dependent on caretakers and bedridden until she died later from complications. My mother's incapacitation had been an awakening. That's when I began to realize the emotional distancing of these chemicals, the ways they manipulated our bodies, that we short-circuited natural rhythms and brain waves with our own desires to live on techno time, downing empathetic supplements and cognitive aids for retention, liquid sleep, sleep negators, pills to simulate the effects of exercise at a cellular level, you name it. My father was distraught, but it wasn't lasting. He was distracted. He didn't feel personally responsible and remained deeply invested in the company and the product and its vision of success. He wanted me to keep taking my enhancements on schedule. He remarried within a year and continued to work with Lumen in the same capacity. I couldn't forgive him. We became estranged and I left. I vividly remember my first encounter with the resistors, our attempt to find the camps, and unsure whether we would or what we'd find when we did. It was just after the factory fire, and I wrote my entries in my journal. Here's the first. June 23rd. The swift arm of night sweeps along the suited branch and bow. Its fistful of fingers uncoil and point north sending us over burnt mount through factory, fires broken knees and wear, cold wind crack against cheek and hand. We walked covered in black boot pant and bomber jacket, hat with hair tucked under, faces covered, scarves swaddling necks. Risk no exposure, leave no trace. What we brought with us, Devices without tracking chips. Bags of dried fruit, soy, and an amame. Liquid energy, 5,000 kJ per milliliter. Three full-size pouches of instant heat. Inflatable sleep kits and a tent sleeps three. Willow bark, sweet lentil, and honey tea. Tablets for water purity, inhalers, bandages, many. Concentrate of vitamin B and D, paper journals, pens, and such for recording. Azulia is still groggy, detoxed for only 24. Sela, though, appears strong, talking more. In me, my mind is coming in fits and starts. Went on, going strong. Unpredictable. We're not going back, not to that. Not to chemical dependence, force feeding memory. Not to factual gluttony, nor to patriarchal hegemony. Not to lies about what we need. I was surprised by the silence. Wilted grass, the absence of animal piles of soot. Celeste swore she saw trees moving towards us in the distance. Phalanxes of men in suits hiding behind trunks. Moving in to win a stake on the hill now that the factor is burned. Too late for them, already rebuilding, and quickly we saw small shoots of steel rods and brick pushing up from the ground, foundations forming already. Or was this what remained? I'm not sure. Sela is more assured. I don't trust her entirely. She's tuned up in elsewhere, seemingly sharper, and yet these men and trees. Something is off, but we are helping her to safety, away. This time we will see to it. She's asked us to help her meet up with the group. They call themselves resistors and that they dissipate the dominant power. She learned about them from a friend on the unit who lived in the encampments. She said this friend had an intricate map etched on her arms, a web of rail and road to camps marked with points of resistance. Celia had heard of their alternative living arrangements, of living without enhancement. Resi resistors live in the chronolento, i.e. human time. 
We saw a swarm of tents on our descent from Factory Hill. Dark sky still lightning, tents like mushrooms, five in a row. I was worried we'd wake the sleeping bear. These were stations for forensic teams and investigators looking into what had caused the fire, or so discerned. Hannah ducked into the first, then motioned for us to enter. It was filled with equipment, with black plastic crates piled high with building models and sketches. The next was empty. In the third were two sleeping bags laid against the wall. The closer one sat with a startle. Scared us, too. A woman, she said we shouldn't be here. She wouldn't say what she was doing, for whom, or from where. And no, she didn't know my friend Tara, but she knew of the camps of resistors. She'd been there. I asked where. Always mobile, migrant, camp is set for a few weeks and then moves. She said there were bases, with one quite near. It had been a long time since she'd had contact with anyone there, even longer since she visited. Was she one of them? No, not really. I still remember her answer, ideal in lines of curiosity. I can tell you how to get there, but then you really must be on your way. We said, yes, please. I suspect she was lying about her lack of involvement, though I couldn't put my finger on it. The concealment was conspicuous, and yet I'm not sure how to define it. She knew too much about the resistors, about the site, the extent of contamination, the chemical infiltrate, the causes of respiratory distress, a byproduct that competes with oxygen to bind blood. I saw charts, piles of paper with chemical structures and notes scrawled. There were blueprints in the old factory, I presumed, with boil, boilers and chemical equations, and yet her allegiances seemed anything but corporate. This still mystifies me. I'm pretty sure she was squatting as a resistor or working as a double agent. I never crossed paths with her again. As far as I know, none of us did. The resistors were always dispersed gathering as a unit in one place, dispersing, and later congregating in new locations and configurations. It was our intention to be self-sufficient, working in solidarity but separately. This was important to both me and Jeff from the very beginning. We envisioned forming a non-hierarchical society of women who could live independently from society, free from male influence. But we didn't believe in containment or in self-denial requiring them rigidly up to an ideal. We wanted the camps to be a refuge, a place to gather strength. You could come and leave and come back again. Many women just stayed. It was harder to sustain when women started to bring their children. They're more dependent on social fabric, developing a network of relationships. Even so, they adapted well. We had a communal space for children to play and for their caretaking. We shared the responsibility. Well, some of us did. Our roles varied according to our strengths. I was an educator and would teach lessons on science and environment, mushroom foraging and such. But you asked about the beginning. It's impossible to isolate. I would say resistors started when I met Jack. We were 18 in the same outward bound training program for a year, the year before university for me, before Jack went on to other things. Jack was like lightning and I was the rod, guiding her energy. Her energy, that's the first thing I noticed. She had presence. When she spoke, she was heard. I was more of a behind the scenes type, which allowed me to cross between sides rather easily, to infiltrate, to uncover useful information. This worked out well for us both. I do remember the first time I met Shanna. First day of desert backpacking and survival. We both wore short sleeves and got terrible sunburns. She shared her packet of aloes and cooling rub with me. She was there for practical reasons. I was too, but I was never practical. I went in knowing that I needed to find a way to sustain myself and live apart from the surroundings where I'd grown up. She was going in to inform all parts of her life. I didn't sense subversiveness as part of character. I guess I accentuated that. Shanna has always been type A, the doer, the executioner, as in she knows how to carry out what's envisioned. 
At first, I thought we were so very different that it took me a while to see that we were actually complementary. I was, and still am, a ruminator with melancholic tendencies. And yet I was desperate to break from the dysphoric and deadening habits and patterns I'd grown up with. So Jack and me and five of our friends decided to set up camp for the summer by the river. We would forage for mushrooms and fish for food, and we attempted to plant vegetables too. With that, we didn't have much luck, but we designed and made our tents with multiple compartments. They were waterproof and durable. We gathered fibrous plants like reeds and cattails and cotton and devised ways to refine and dye them. We observed animal lives around us. We'd sing at night, around the fire, play instruments, and one person, if not all, would record the day's activities and their opinions on it in this communal notebook. Even then, just us seven, it felt like we were on the cusp of something big. And maybe that bigness was just the fullness of our lives and friendships expanding as we've chosen to live them out. And this feeling of bigness wasn't mitigated by the difficulties of acclimation either. Some of us who were first coming off feed were rather spotty, coming in and out of full consciousness. We also had to ration our food. I lost 14, not that that was a bad thing. We decided to do it the next year too, and that was when we named ourselves. This was before anyone had heard about the resistors. We heard rumors of women who rejected our complete dependence on chemical supplements and modifiers, on technology, on artificially induced rapid fire that was passed on to us. I became involved through Sila, helping her seek out a safe space after an unsupervised withdrawal short circuited her brain. The factory fire was crucial in the way it made so many other question foul Victorian and our cultural dependence. And there's also speculation about the resistor's involvement in the factory fire. But if resistors had a hand in it, I think they would have flaunted it. Resistors aren't known to be coy or soft-spoken about these matters. And yet I still wonder what that woman in the tent was doing, whose side she was on. She gave us such detailed directions. We spent the rest of the day following the highway, tracing its curve until we reached the departure point. As soon as we saw the crest of a distant glowing hill, we went to walk in the opposite direction. It was full of toxic waste, or so the myth went, and the skin of those who traveled too close would disintegrate. We followed a trail of soil and stone for another half mile until we reached a cove, and just beyond the cove we saw their iconic tents, stark white and hive like like a swarm of women buzzing around a fire. And so this is the Wooler piece that was found at the resistor site after the factory fire during the police raid. Um, although there's no link that's been proven, it does say it all has to burn, it's going to blaze, it's filthy and can't be saved. Yeah, it's questionable. June 25th. Women gathered in clusters, seemingly surprised when we arrived. This camp's not easy to find, Ruth. The head woman is tall, over six feet, I think. She wore large black coveralls and a red handkerchief on her head. Giant but gentle, she showed us where to leave our bags, just outside before entry. She asked so many questions. Had we detoxed? For how long? Any lingering effects? Yes, we all have them. She understood. It gets better here. Your reason for coming here? Escape, Sila said, before launching into the story of her friend. We nodded. Ruth nodded too, said she remembered terror striking physical cartography. Nothing surprised her except when we mentioned the women in the factory camp had led us here, which made her pause. We were asked to leave our devices on the outskirts padlocked. At first, I hesitated. I worried about what would happen if I needed it, though tried to remind myself that even if I did, there was no signal, no charger, no battery packs. It took a while to adjust. I stayed three months. I've gone back since, but the first time was the most significant. During our first week, we sewed tents with compartments that we stacked like hives and dwelled inside. We were taught how to gather berries, how to with a stick, how to find worms, and how to hook them. Disgusting. We learned how 
to find our own direction and how to build a blazing fire. It seemed rudimentary, but it was enriching and necessary. It gave me confidence. We also went swimming and kayaking, and despite the distance, news from other camps came weekly, at least. There were messengers who bandied between camps. There were designated rovers, too. It took me months to adjust, but my mind gradually opened. At night, I would open the top flap of my tent and stare out at the distance, the galaxies, the stars, and beyond, that chaotic swirl of matter and life of which we made up in an insignificant fraction. The camps were like pockets of imagination where we shared histories and visions and dreams. And often we helped each other envision ways for returning to society while continuing our resistance. The separation, it never really felt fully real, but that's okay. To dissipate power, I had to return to society. Sila, she stayed. By the time I left, she had started to acquire her own filigree of river and road and migratory pattern so that she could begin to travel and regroup. There was a rhythm and a dance, and she wasn't ever coming back. So that is the end of the recorded material. Um, I am happy to entertain any questions or have a dialogue about the resistors, any interest you might have. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, what, so what happened after the police raid on the camp? Did they shut it down? They weren't able to find any, any link, any yeah. specific link. Um, and the, the resistors operated so that they would set up camps and then, you know, and then take them down and move. So, you know, they just... They so they're out. still out there? So they're still out there, yeah. I mean, you know, this was probably 10, 10 years ago or so. So, you know, they've kind of dissipated a bit, but... Do you know yeah. where, did you say where they were localized? Uh, they were localized in the Pacific Northwest, but kind of, you know, all over. Just I was just thinking of those, the towers that the camps built, and it looked similar to this pumpkin-like water tower that I've seen in the, in the rural part of Illinois. Oh, well, there might be they an outpost, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just, they move, yeah. Were, were they were they only resisting the valedictorium, or was there were there other chemical influences no, I mean, that the society like at the time was putting on them? They were resisting the enforcement of of the socially enforced uh, medicating and enhancing, and so they were valedictorium was was their main point of resistance, or of what ignited this, but no, I mean, it was more, it was more of like the social framework too of, of you know, uh, this being imposed on their bodies. What other kinds of chemicals were they, were they resisting? I mean, what, what other kinds of ways were people operating themselves chemically? Oh, I mean, in so many ways. I mean, I think that valedictorian was probably one of the most imposed, um, just because it was used frequently among school-age children and, you know, adults. Um, so they, there was also, I mean, kind of you name it, I mean, they had uh, pills for, you know, working out, um, pills for euphoria, pills for, um, I mean, I have a whole list of, uh, you know, uh, I would say many of them are somewhat like pills that we have today, but, you know, the the, the augmentation is so far exceeds what we can see, conceive of. Um, That's good to hear. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we've gotten away from it somewhat. That we haven't. Do so you think the resistors were successful in movements? They were. Um, they were successful in in leading people to question. Yeah, I mean, at that point in time, you know, it was, it was, you know, just accepted that, you know, students had to take these. But then, you know, it's also, it's, they were successful 
um, there are also the detrimental effects of, of memory hoarding and storage. And so, I mean, they, they weren't as successful as, I don't, I don't think that they, um, I don't know how many people woke up to their idea of, you know, like, of, I don't think that people necessarily had the same motivation. It was more an acknowledgement of the negative effects. Mm -hmm. What were the requirements for being a member? Did you have to have felt the detrimental effects of prescription medicine, or could anybody join? No, I mean, they were. Female? It was, well, it was a, a female group, just it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't like the Solanus, like the Solanus quote that was up, you know, like annihilating men was not, you know, part of their mission, although there were some radical feminists who did join the group and felt that way, but they felt like it, it was a feminine, it should be a feminine space. Um, and, uh, and basically people would just come out and find them. It was spread by word of mouth, they didn't try to recruit people, but there were no requirements of having to have, have you know, a negative drug experience or um, it was more a shared sensibility of, of wanting to disengage from, um, disengage from the society in which they live. Um, what do you think the future of the researchers based on your observation? The future of what? Uh, like the future of this group. The future of this group? Um, you know, I think that numbers have dwindled. I don't know. I mean, it's more of a, I, I think that, you know, they, it's hard to say because they're they're self-sustaining. I mean, they you know they'll form a camp, and you know like, then then they'll disperse and so, um, and form elsewhere, um, and so, you know I don't I don't think that they're necessarily they aren't planning, you know an overthrow. Um, they're just trying to live separately and, um, in their own way, you know draw people out who are attracted to that lifestyle. Do you think there will be a trend, you know, like, like easy to be, like, um, accept or, for like more people want to do a similar thing? Right, like, well I don't it think- It sounds like a really, like exciting, they went into the woods and like build up all the laws and stuff and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just like wondering, yeah, as yeah, if there's any possible, like, you know, they starting this kind of like, hip like hipster, hipster lifestyle. But, oh, you know, yeah. no, they, they, would, <laughs> they would reject that type of popularity. They would not, I mean, they wouldn't, they don't, they don't try to promote themselves. They don't, you know, they aren't, while they're trying to have an effect on the ways that people think and um, they don't, they don't want media attention. I mean, they wouldn't actually, they don't want to be on camera. They are just. But like your role is like telling people what they do, and they're like kind of waiting to take over or like tell all their own stories and like the drama in their group. So um, if you like keep on doing this lecture to like more and more people, maybe it's like you are will be the media. It, it's possible that I might be working counter to their motives, but that's you know, I'm, it's it's my line of work. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? No. All right. Well, thank you.